when you talk about the autonomic nervous system, key thing to highlight and remember is what is controlled by the autonomic nervous system. What's the, who's the boss? What part of the brain is the boss of the autonomic nervous system? Do you remember? Yeah, I heard it, the hypothalamus. Yeah, the hypothalamus is the major controller of the autonomic nervous system. And the cells of the autonomic nervous system that are under the control of the hypothalamus is smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. We cannot control those things, right? Those are all involuntary. So that when we say subconscious, it just means it's not part of our conscience. We don't, oh, boo. This has been doing this lately. How do I unhighlight? Does anybody have an idea? What happens? Yeah. And that's the question. How do I erase? Oh, there we go. Okay, I learned something. Um, so subconscious control. And again, it's the hypothalamus that controls this. So I just saw that little note. Let's see what happens when I do this. Hypothalamus controls the ANS. Did that show up on the slide? No. All right, never mind then. Okay, so very important part of the brain controls this. It's very hard to write with a mouse. <laughs> it looks like a kindergartner. Okay. So it's part of the peripheral nervous system. It's the response from the body. So we're talking about that, uh, those descending pathways. Okay, so they're coming down the spinal cord in those tracks and then heading out via spinal nerves to an organ. And again, what are those organs? Heart, glands, smooth muscle. What are some examples of smooth muscle? Digestive tract, urinary tract, reproductive tract, blood vessels, our um, erector pili muscles in our skin, those are all under autonomic control. Subconscious control, our body's taking care of it, we don't have to worry about it. When you ate your breakfast this morning or you drank your fluid, your autonomic nervous system is taking that food and fluid and putting it where it needs to go, right? With smooth muscle contraction. Your blood pressure is where it is because of smooth muscle contraction in your blood vessels that is, that is tightly controlled. And again, the hypothalamus is boss on that. And the, uh, the medulla is also important for processing information and controlling and adjusting. So um, we'll talk more about that. So autonomic nervous system is part of the peripheral nervous system. It's part of the motor division. Somatic nervous system is skeletal muscle, right? So when we talk about somatic nervous system, that's voluntary skeletal muscle. So the motor cortex controls that movement, right? So somatic nervous system, I want you to think skeletal muscle, voluntary control, movement. This is just our check and balance system. This is all about homeostasis, the autonomic nervous system. It's maintaining homeostasis. And we know the sympathetic nervous system is the fight or flight, right? It's the stress. It's getting our body ready to, to deal with danger or, or stress. And the parasympathetic nervous system is the rest and digest. It starts with a P. So in nursing school, you can remember it as the, the poop and pee <laughs> division. It helps us eliminate waste, controls that. It, when that is dominating, when the parasympathetic nervous system is dominating, is when people can urinate and move their bowels comfortably because that smooth muscle is stimulated when the parasympathetic neurons are dominating. And when do the parasympathetic neurons dominate? When we're resting, when we're in a restful state. So when a person is, is under a high amount of stress, that suppresses digestion, which means acids build up, 
People end up with a lot of acid reflux symptoms. They end up with constipation, nausea, just feeling unwell. And that's because the sympathetic neurons are dominating and they're inhibiting those digestive processes. Same thing when people are busy at work. They don't feel the urge to urinate because they're just busy and they can go a whole 12-hour shift and realize, my gosh, I never used the bathroom for an entire 12-hour shift. That's not good, right? We need to have downtime to pay attention to our body and also make sure we're getting enough fluid, too. Oftentimes, people can work a 12-hour shift and the only beverage they took in was coffee, right? And that's not a hydrating fluid. So we got to pay attention, just take a, take a break. And what I try to do when I'm th thinking it, because that happens to me as well, is when I'm you know, um, passing by the water fountain, I just fill up a cup and I just slam it real quick and try to do that a couple of times during my shift just to make sure I'm making a conscious effort to get fluid in. Because you don't have time to sip on water. Sometimes you can bring a you know, beverage in and store it in a cabinet in some of the nurses' stations at Gunderson, but it just depends on the environment and what's in that container. You know, if it's caffeinated beverage, then that's not, you know, hydrating. So homeostasis is really controlled by the autonomic nervous system in conjunction with the endocrine system. So we talked about the endocrine system and all those important hormones that act on cells to get them to do their jobs. Well, this is part of the nervous system, so this involves neurons. And again, they're dominating when we're in a stress environment. That's the sympathetic division. And then when the parasympathetic is dominating, those neurons are creating a rest and digest effect. So the effectors, this is just the organs that are acted upon by these neurons, skeletal muscle, and we already said the autonomic is cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands. So if I look at these neurons, they come off in different places depending on the division. So the parasympathetic has a lot of cranial nerves. So we have the iris of the eye, which controls the size of the pupil for vision. That comes off of the brain, the brain stem. So this is a cranial nerve, right? Salivary glands, cranial nerve. Then look at this. This is cranial nerve number 10. What is cranial nerve number 10? The vagus nerve. Look at all these organs that are controlled by the vagus nerve coming off the brain stem. A lot, right? So 90% of the neurons for the parasympathetic nervous system run through the vagus nerve. So when we stimulate the vagus nerve, it has an impact on all these organs. And this is the parasympathetic nervous system. So if then we come down to the bottom, the bladder and the genitals, those are controlled by the sacral region of the spinal cord. So those neurons exit, start and exit at the sacral region of the spinal cord. So when people have damage, spinal cord injuries to the lower part of their spinal cord, they have trouble controlling the bladder and the genitals. So what that means is people with spinal bifida, have you heard of spinal bifida when babies are born with an open spine? It, it doesn't close on the end of their spinal cord and they have this big fluid sac and there's damage to the sacral region of the spinal cord. They have trouble emptying their bladder. They cannot relax that external urethra, which is under voluntary control, they can't, so they have to self-calf to get the, the urine to flow. And they can be, you know, otherwise healthy people, but without that sacral region of the spinal cord controlling those um, muscles, they have to self-calf to empty their bladder. So when we stimulate the vagus nerve, we're stimulating a rest and digest situation. So one way we can stimulate the vagus nerve is through the Valsalva maneuver. Have you talked about that in your other classes yet? If you had me for general, we talked about it. Does anybody remember what the Valsalva maneuver is? Bearing down. And uh, an easier way to do that, when you tell an old man, and this happened on our floor, this old man, his heart rates were really high in the 120s, and everybody ran in the room because the alarm went off on his telemetry box, and we're all in the room. And they're like, someone was yelling, can you bear down? Because he was like 85, hard of hearing, and everybody's in the room, and he's like, what's going on? And he's like, can you bear down? And he's like, what does that mean? You know, he was just kind of sitting there not knowing. And then I said, can you cough? Give us a good cough. It was incredible. He goes, <coughs> that week, and boop, right down went his heart rate back into the 80s. And I was like, oh my gosh, that is incredible that just a cough, that little bit of pressure when we close the glottis right before a cough, 
stimulated the vagus nerve enough to bring his heart rate down. So when in doubt, just have the person cough. I've done it myself. One time when I, if I exercise and I'm not in shape, I sometimes get this supraventricular tachycardia where you just, I get this really high heart rate when I'm like, in, like when we were playing on this basketball league and you know, someone makes a shot and I'm just kind of walking and all of a sudden my heart is like really fast. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's upsetting. It's not a normal high heart rate. And I'll just cough a few times hard and it goes right back to the normal exercise heart rate. So it's a really good thing to know about because you can help people with really high heart rates. But what happens if you have someone with a really low heart rate, and that happens, some people have heart blocks and their heart rate is intrinsically low, like in the 50s, and they're sitting on the toilet getting ready to discharge, trying to have a bowel movement, and they're constipated because they've been on a bunch of pain meds. What can happen as they're bearing down on the toilet? They can pass out. And that has happened. There's a story in a clinical environment where a person was bearing down on the toilet on discharge, fell off the toilet, hit his head on the toilet paper roll thing, and died on discharge. And they were otherwise ready to go. I mean, can you imagine the horror of the health people taking care of him when that happened? So stool softeners, we think that's pretty low-level nursing, right, making sure people are moving their bowels. But for people with heart rhythm issues, it's important that their bowels are are moving and they're not straining, especially if they have low heart rate, low blood pressure. Okay, so that's the vagus nerve. And then, um, so that's the, the parasympathetic. Now the sympathetic nervous system has neurons that come off the thoracic and the lumbar region of the spinal cord. So there's two neurons in series. There's the preganglionic neuron and the postganglionic neuron. So here's a ganglia. This is the sympathetic chain. Do you remember this from general A and P? You had a, we had that model and it had the kind of beaded chain next to the spinal cord that you had to know. It was the sympathetic chain ganglia. So this is where the preganglionic axon terminals end and the cell bodies of the postganglionic start. So these are all the sympathetics. You can see the sympathetic controls a couple of more, a few more things in the parasympathetic. For example, the skin. The sympathetic nervous system controls the erector pili muscle of the skin. So when you're scared or nervous, what happens? You get goosebumps, right? So that's a contraction of those. And uh, what's not listed on here are the blood vessels. The blood vessels have parasympathetic fibers only. And it causes the blood vessels to contract. And if the blood vessels contract and constrict the, those passageways, what happens to blood pressure? It goes up, yeah. So if we have sympathetic domination, which is stress, blood pressure goes up, right? So, so this is called the thoracolumbar re division because the neurons come off the thoracic and lumbar region of the spinal cord, and the parasympathetic is called the craniosacral division because the neurons come off the brain stem and the sacral region of the spinal cord. So sometimes we get what's called referred pain which means you can have uh, injury or dysfunction of an organ and it travels to different surfaces of the skin because they, they share the same pathway to the spinal cord as these other um, spinal nerves for sensation in the skin or in the joint. For example, people can complain of jaw pain when they have, or having a heart attack because of referred pain. So you can see the heart here, those neurons, those sensory neurons as they enter the spinal cord share the same pathway as some of these dermatomes and also deeper tissues like in the joint and in the ear. People complain of ear pain sometimes with a heart attack. If you have a gallbladder issue, what kind of pain are people gonna complain about? Shoulder pain, right shoulder pain. So when a person comes in and they're just feeling unwell, and they're like, oh, my shoulder just really hurts right here. They're going to think gallbladder because that's referred pain. So the liver, liver disease, again, people feel it right here when they have liver pain on the upper part of their neck. Okay, so those are the two divisions, and they are controlled. Those neurons here, so these neurons... There's two neurons in a series. The preganglionic is, re is releasing neurotransmitters. The postganglionic is binding those neurotransmitters and sending an impulse 
and then releasing neurotransmitters to bind to the cells of these organs. So it's all about those important neurotransmitters we talked about in our last lecture. So if we look at terminology, what's the root word in cholinergic? What neurotransmitter do you think? Yeah, acetylcholine. So cholinergic refers to acetylcholine. So these are fibers that release ACH. So if, uh, I have a handout for you. Um, it's in your, I think it's in our folder. If it's not, I'll put it there. I might have to pull it up. I'm going to pause this for. All right, so there's a diagram in your notes I'm going to refer to in just a minute. But just know that what is the root word when you see the word adrenergic? Adrenaline. Adrenaline. And another name for adrenaline, which is a neurotransmitter in the body we give to people that are having anaphylactic shock, bee stings, food allergies, you know, cardiac arrest. Epinephrine or norepinephrine, yeah. So that's the same thing as adrener or adrenaline, okay? So adrenergic are fibers that release norepinephrine. So I'm going to show you this next. It'll make more sense. If I look at these neurons here, so this is the preganglionic neuron. This is the postganglionic neuron. Preganglionic, postganglionic. So this is in your notes, but it also matches the handout as well. So if I look at this, these neurons start in the spinal cord. So if I look right here, these neurons start in the spinal cord. And this is from your textbook. So if I go back here, right, everybody agrees these neurons start in the spinal cord? So I'm looking at the preganglionic and the postganglionic. So it's the, here's this, the, the dendrites start in the spinal cord. Okay, so the sympathetic neurons, the preganglionic neurons, release ACH. Can you see that? ACH is being released there. And we also have a sympathetic neuron that stimulates the adrenal medulla to secrete epinephrine to the blood. Remember, epinephrine is one of those that goes to the blood. Okay, so this ACH is released from the preganglionic neuron. And the parasympathetic neuron also releases ACH. So what type of neurons, using this terminology, are all preganglionic neurons? Cholinergic, right? So that's why this says all preganglionic axons are cholinergic because they release acetylcholine. And that is always going to stimulate that postganglionic neuron to do its job. So we go back to this. So the postganglionic neuron then is shown here. Notice how long it is compared to how short it is here. So the parasympathetic neuron has a really long preganglionic and a short postganglionic. Or these, they're not, not a huge difference. So if we look at the postganglionic neuron of sympathetic neurons, they release norepinephrine because sympathetic is the fight or flight, right? So we would it would make sense that we want to stimulate these cells, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands, right? We want to stimulate these, these cells with norepinephrine if the sympathetic neurons are dominating. So we not only locally secrete it onto these cells, but it's also secreted into the blood. So when a person has a stressful event, it's going to take a while for that epinephrine to break down and not feel stressed out. So when we come home from a stressful day and sit down and think, oh, I'm so relaxed now, people feel heart palpitations, they just have trouble relaxing, that's because epinephrine has been released in the blood all day long. It's going to take a while to break that down. Okay, so that's norepinephrine. So these, what type of neurons are these then? It's the postganglionic neuron, but using the terms, what type of fibers? 
adrenergic. Yep, adrenergic. So the sympathetic nervous system has adrenergic when you want to rev up the body. So what would that do to, to these organs? What would norepinephrine do to these organs? Promote digestion or inhibit digestion? If we're stressed out, it would inhibit digestion. What happens is blood flow to the digestive tract will decrease and is diverted to the muscles because it's a fight or flight situation. We don't want blood going to the gut. We want it in the muscles, right? So how do people feel when they have a full belly and need to digest and they exercise really hard right after? Yeah, feel sick because there's not enough blood supply to the digestive tract and stuff stops and causes nausea. Okay, so then if we look at the parasympathetic, when we're in a relaxed state, that postganglionic neuron releases, all postganglionic neurons of the parasympathetic nervous system release what? ACH. So what type of neuron is this? <laughs> Cholinergic. 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 So if you look at the choices then, everything is cholinergic, right? All cholinergic except this one, right? Except the sympathetic postganglionic neuron, that one is adrenergic. It releases norepinephrine. Would you agree? So that's where when you're studying this stuff, look for commonality so you don't have to study each piece individually. Just know, okay, they're all acetylcholine except for the sympathetic postganglionic. So receptors are on the postganglionic neuron, on the adrenal medulla, and on these cells to bind these neurotransmitters. So those receptors, so like the digestive tract has receptors for both, depending if we want to inhibit digestion, then they're going to bind norepinephrine. If we need to promote digestion, we're going to bind acetylcholine, as long as these divisions are dominating, right? It depends which one is dominating. Okay, so for example, if I eat just a small amount and I want to do a long run, well then I don't want the, my digestive tract to be working. I want blood flow to my muscles. I don't want any blood going to my digestive tract. So a person that's going to do a run or heavy exercise, they're going to eat something light that doesn't require a lot of digestion. Okay, so the receptors then, we have cholinergic receptors for acetylcholine, we have adrenergic receptors for norepinephrine. So again, they're going to be binding different neurotransmitters depending on what the state of the body is. So let's go to the next slide. I think this is a good one here. So acetylcholine, there's two types of cholinergic receptors. There's nicotinic and muscarinic. So nicotinic, the effects of a nicotinic receptor are always stimulation. So if I look at this diagram again, and you can use your handout and label that if you want, but whenever we release a neurotransmitter and it's acetylcholine, and the cell is stimulated by binding, we call it a nicotinic receptor. So these are all nicotinic receptors here on the adrenal medulla, on the postganglionic dendrites, those are all nicotinic receptors. And what is the root word in nicotinic, do you think? Nicotine, yeah. So nicotine binds to these receptors, and it's stimulatory. So people are stimulated by nicotine. Okay, so that's what that is. And then there's another type called muscarinic, and muscarinic are found on all of our organs, and they bind ACH. So if they bind ACH and they're found on the organs, what is the effect going to be? What is the only neuron that releases ACH to the organs? If you look at this diagram here, parasympathetic or sympathetic releases ACH to the organs? Parasympathetic. So if we have muscarinic receptors on cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands, what happens to the cardiac muscle when it binds ACH? Slows, right. Heart rate goes down, contraction. Well, heart rate goes down is pretty much it. We'll talk more about that when we get into the cardiac uh, 
physiology. <clears throat> so heart rate goes down when it binds ACH. What happens when it binds norepinephrine? What's going to happen to the heart? Heart rate's going to go up, right? Because that's a stimulatory. Okay, but we're talking about muscarinic receptors. So what happens when ACH binds to muscarinic receptors on the di in the digestive tract? Well, what is the parasympathetic? So we're, the only neuron that releases ACH is the parasympathetic postganglionic. What does parasympathetic stand for? Rest and digest. So if we release ACH onto the digestive tract, it's going to bind to muscarinic receptors. And what is a digestive tract going to do? It's going to do its thing, right? It's going to digest. Things are going to move through the tract. People aren't going to feel full. They're not going to have that acid reflux sensation, gas or bloating, right? There, things are just going to move right through and we'll be good. So when ACH binds to muscarinic receptors on any organs, I mean, this isn't showing all the organs, what happens if it binds muscarinic receptors on the bladder? Is it going to help relax or contract the bladder? If we relax the bladder, can we pee if it's relaxed? No. Smooth muscle in the bladder needs to contract in order to pee. So we want smooth muscle contraction to pee. So who wants to contract their bladder? A person with uh, urinary retention due to enlarged prostate or a woman with incontinence? What? If I relax the bladder, urine does not move. Right? If I relax my arm, does it move? No. Can urine flow if I, re if I whoa, with the bladder? Does urine flow if I relax the bladder? No. <laughs> if I relax the bladder, it's not going to flow, right? Like if I have a sponge that's full of water and I don't squeeze it, does the water come out? No. To get the water out, we got to contract the bladder. So the question is, you have a person with an enlarged prostate and they have trouble with urinary retention, do we want to have the parasympathetic nervous system dominating or the sympathetic nervous system dominating? What is the sympathetic nervous system? Does the sympathetic nervous system cause us to pee? We said parasympathetic starts with a P, and it makes us go pee, and it makes us go poop and it makes us salivate, and it makes us secrete digestive enzymes so we don't have acid reflux and bad gut. So, <laughs> so the lady with urinary incontinence, do we want to relax her bladder or contract it? Yes! <laughs> we want to relax her bladder. We don't want her to contract and pee, right? We want to relax that bladder to hold the urine so she can go when it's convenient, right? But the guy with the enlarged prostate, we need to help him pee. So we want to do what to the bladder? Contract it. So which neuron do we want to stimulate? Parasympathetic neuron, yeah, to contract that bladder. So you don't want to get confused. Contraction isn't always a stimulatory thing in the, in the sense of sympathetic, parasympathetic. The parasympathetic can stimulate what does it stimulate, though? It stimulates the organs for peeing, pooping, digesting, salivating, anything related to rest and digest and urinating. And think of it as wet. The parasympathetic is wet. It's all about moving fluids through, right? So tearing, that's a classic one. I can't tell you how many times I've made a mental note of, oh, there's the parasympathetic dominating as my three-year-old sitting on the toilet in Walmart. I got to go poop. So you're sitting there, you can't leave them alone in the stall because you got to wipe their butt. So you sit there and they're like looking at you and, oh! <laughs> and then you see their eyes water. And that's the parasympathetic nervous system. The, it's dominating, so they're moving their stool and it causes the eyes to water. So <laughs> that's the parasympathetic domination. Okay, so we need to bind, re so here's the beauty of this and so why do we care, right? Why do we need to know this? You're giving medicines that mimic these neurotransmitters. So when you give somebody Flomax, when you give a patient Flomax because they have an enlarged prostate, you're stimulating which neuron? 
or which receptors, let's make it more specific, you're stimulating which receptors on that bladder? Muscarinic or we didn't talk about the other type yet. Let's hold, let's hold off on that. Hang on, I'll ask you th that in just a minute. So we have muscarinic or nicotinic. Nicotinic is always stimulatory. Muscarinic might inhibit. For example, um, let's think of an example of inhibition with muscarinic. It's going to inhibit the heart rate, right? The SA node. So we have slower heart rate, right? Muscarinic receptor on the heart. All right. When I look at norepinephrine, what it binds to, it has all these lovely receptors depending on what the cell is. But here's the key things that I want you to know. I want you to know beta 1, beta 2, and alpha. I don't care about alpha 1 or alpha 2. You're not going to get into that kind of detail even in the nursing program. I've never had to go beyond beta 1, beta 2, and alpha, okay? And I have a graduate degree in physiology. So beta 1, number one thing you need to know is it binds to the heart. We have one heart beta-1 receptors. We have how many lungs? Two, so beta-2 receptors. Good way to remember it. Beta-1, heart, beta-2, lungs. So what is it going to do to the heart if this norepinephrine binds to these beta-1 receptors on the heart? It's going to increase the heart rate, right? It's going to increase the contraction. It's going to dilate the blood vessels serving the heart because we're fighting or flighting right now, right? When is norepinephrine being released? When we're fighting or flighting. So do I want to give a medicine to bind beta-1 receptors with someone with heart failure and high blood pressure? No. I want to block beta-1 receptors, beta blockers, right? Metoprolol, propanolol, all those olol medicines we give are blocking beta-1 receptors. So norepinephrine can't bind, and then the heart rate stays down. Blood pressure is decreased. Beta-2 receptors, I think, think again, the lungs are binding norepinephrine to fight or flight. What do we want to do with the airways if we're in a fight or flight? Do we want to dilate them or constrict them? Dilate them. So in this case, we're relaxing smooth muscle in the airways when norepinephrine binds to beta-2 receptors because we want to relax so we can breathe better. How about the iris of the eye? So if I look at alpha receptors, we find these all over the place. The bladder is one. So what are we going to do when we bind beta, or I'm sorry, alpha, alpha 1? What's going to happen to the bladder when norepinephrine binds to alpha 1 receptors on the bladder? <sighs> We're doing it again. Yeah, blood vessels, but I'm talking about the bladder, the smooth muscle of the bladder. Okay, I, but I'm asking you to apply. So with the bladder has alpha receptors. Norepinephrine binds to the bladder. You're in a fight or flight situation. Is this time to pee? No. no. <laughs> Sometimes it can happen if you get really fight or flighted, right? But no, the body is not saying, hey, let's make some urine now. No, or let's pass urine. No, we're going to, so what is the bladder going to do? Is it going to relax or contract and pee? Relax. It's going to relax. Good, good. <laughs> All right, so the pupil of the eye, you're in a fight or flight. Do you want to let a lot of light in for good vision and dilate, or do you want to constrict and not let much light in? You'd want to dilate the pupils when the parasympathetic, when the sympathetic, sorry, sympathetic nervous system is dominating. So all these receptors, just whenever you see those receptors, think fight or flight. And what are those organs going to do when norepinephrine binds to those receptors? So the medicines we give, we call some of them anticholinergics, cholinergics. If a medicine is an anticholinergic, What's the effect on the body? Anti, so it's anti-acetylcholine. So anti-acetylcholine, so if we go back to this, we're blocking this. Anticholinergic. So we're not, instead of being wet, 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 we're going to be dry, 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 right? So who would want an anticholinergic? My gentleman with the enlarged prostate or my lady with urinary incontinence? 
urinary incontinence would want an anticholinergic, right? Because it'll keep her from peeing. And people take these things. How about a person with severe developmental delays that has trouble controlling their secretions, so they drool a lot? Would you want to give them a cholinergic or anticholinergic? Anticholinergic, just to keep them dry, right? So those are just some examples. People get those in surgery, too. We want to control secretions in surgery. Ever have surgery and wake up and your mouth is so dry and parched? It's because they gave you atropine during surgery to dry up your secretions. Okay, so um, if we look at our organs then, they have dual innervation. And what that means is that you have a sympathetic neuron stimulating the heart and you have a parasympathetic neuron stimulating the heart. It just depends on the conditions in the body which one is dominating. So dual innervation just means we have both types of neurons stimulating. So the sympathetic neurons are going to increase the heart, parasympathetic neurons are going to decrease the heart. Dual innervation just means both divisions are innervating these organs. Know that definition. And then sympathetic tone means that we always have, like our blood vessels, for example, only have sympathetic neurons stimulating them. So if they're dominating, they're going to constrict. If they're not dominating, they're going to constrict just a little bit. What would happen if we eliminated sympathetic stimulation to our blood vessels? What would happen to the, to the diameter of them if we just took it all out? They would be wide open. And what would happen to blood pressure then? It would go down. So we have to have sympathetic tone to our blood vessels because if we didn't, blood pressure would crash. And sometimes that is a side effect of an epidural. When people have an epidural, they get low blood pressure. Oops. So blood, blood pressure is maintained by sympathetic tone. We always have a little bit of sympathetic stimulation to our blood vessels because there is no parasympathetic neuron to the blood vessels. So it keeps it up. If we lost it, blood pressure would crash. <clears throat> <clears throat> so people take different drugs to stimulate beta blockers, alpha blockers. If we block the alpha receptors on our blood vessels, instead of constricting the blood vessels, it relaxes them. And that's going to decrease blood pressure, right? Parasympathetic tone is important when we have to have a little bit of relaxation always being stimulated. For example, the heart rate is actually intrinsically set, the SA node is intrinsically set to go to fire at 100 without any influence. But because of the parasympathetic neuron, it brings it down to what? What's the average heart rate? The average, like the one number we say is average? 75-ish, yeah, 75 to 80, yeah, but it can be all over, right? Anyway, it's not 100, right? It's lower than that because of parasympathetic tone. A little bit of parasympathetic stimulation is always occurring on the heart to keep our heart rate in that average zone. Same thing, even if you're stressed, you're going to be digesting still. You're still going to be making urine, right? So we have a little bit of parasympathetic tone to our digestive and urinary tracts to keep things moving through, right? So we have a little bit of parasympathetic tone going on all the time. So again, if we want to block the parasympathetic response, that'll increase the heart rate and help people that are retaining urine and stool. Cooperative effects is another term. Cooperative effects is when we have both systems working together to serve a purpose. Reproduction, for example. First, the penis needs to become hard and erect. That's the parasympathetic nervous system. Then it switches from that to ejaculation, which is the sympathetic nervous system. And during ejaculation, symptoms of sympathetic nervous system are evident. There's increased heart rate. There's dilation of the pupils. There's increased breathing and muscle contraction. All of that is part of orgasm, and that's the sympathetic nervous system. So we call that cooperation. They're not acting at the same time, but they're cooperating. Parasympathetic arouses, and sympathetic causes the act of delivery. 
correct, because dual innervation means is just a concept saying that both fibers serve most of our organs. We have parasympathetic neurons and sympathetic neurons. This is saying that the action of the parasympathetic and the sympathetic work together to serve a purpose. And in this case, it's ejaculation and arousal. So when you look at these effects, if we go back to the parasympathetic, this diagram that I was showing you, the parasympathetic neurons release their acetylcholine directly onto the organs that they act on. So because we have acetylcholine esterase to break down that constant binding, that stimulation stops pretty quickly. But norepinephrine is released to the blood. So even though it's released by the postganglionic neuron to bind to these organs, it's also in the blood readily available for a while. So sympathetic effects last longer than parasympathetic effects because it's released to the blood. So these are longer acting because of that adrenal medulla. The adrenal medulla, remember, secretes norepinephrine to the blood. And that's going to make it available a little longer. And that's why it, you know, it takes a little bit to really calm down after a stressful event because of that nor circulating norepinephrine. I actually wrote it right here. I didn't need to do that. And then it's destroyed by the liver. So what happens then in people with liver disease? less able to deal with stress, right? Less able, they feel the effects of stress longer. So we know that the hypothalamus, like I said, is boss of the autonomic nervous system. And we can control that with the limbic system. And the limbic system is kind of our feel good. There's different parts of the brain that contribute to the limbic system. So we can override the hypothalamus, the, the <coughs> limbic system, not override, but influence the hypothalamus. And the cerebral cortex can override it completely. For example, if you're feeling really stressed, people can relax, put themselves in a calm space, right? Practice biofeedback, meditation. You can bring your heart rate down, lower your blood pressure, right? We can do that. We can also do the opposite, right? We can get ourselves all cranked up and negative and feeling bad about things, and we can elevate our, pre our blood pressure and our heart rate. So the cerebral cortex can either help or hurt our bodies, right, and influence the autonomic nervous system. So again, you know, the gut brain they talk about. When we're in a lot of stress, the digestive system shuts down, and that's the cerebral cortex stimulating you know, the hypothalamus to, to a fight or flight response, and we have lots of norepinephrine floating around. So this is just talking about how these systems work together. Our emotions influence our cortex and vice versa, but the hypothalamus is what is going to stimulate those neurons for the parasympathetic or sympathetic domination. So hypothalamus is in charge of some other things in addition to um, autonomic nervous system, body temperature, water balance, endocrine activity. We'll talk more about that hunger and thirst drives. So as we age, what do we get to look forward to? Things are less effective. We have uh, less fluid from those important glands, salivary glands, uh, lacrimal glands of the eyes, so uh, less mucus production in the digestive tract, so dry eyes, constipation, dry mouth, frequent eye infections because of the dry eyes. The blood vessels don't respond as well when we change positions. So when a person goes from laying down in the bed to get up to go to the bathroom, they can get really dizzy due to a blood pressure drop. We call that orthostatic hypotension. Some of you may have that now. Younger women with lower blood pressures tend to have this problem as well. It gets better as you get older. But then when you get really older, then it happens again. So we tell people to sit, you know, sit up, sit for a minute, then rise slowly. And I always ask my patients when they first sit up, 
How are you feeling? Feeling dizzy at all? No, I feel good. Okay, here's your walker. Then you stand up. How are you feeling? Feeling dizzy at all? No, nope, I feel good. Okay, let's go to the bathroom. But you should ask at those two points how they're feeling because sometimes they won't tell you until it's too late. So that's orthostatic hypotension.